Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for your patience. And for those of us who are joining us, those of you who are joining us online, I understand that we're not live this morning. Sorry about that, but I, obviously you found us, and that's great. I, for those of you who are here, I think it's going to be posted online in a couple of hours. Uh, the live stream thing isn't quite working today, and we're not quite sure why. But we're here, and we're here not only to gather together with each other, but also to meet with God on this Sunday between, between Christmas and New Year's. Let's stand up together and sing. And in the tradition of the season, let's start by singing Go Tell Out on the Mountain, a great Christmas carol, and let's do it in the old Southern Alberta country way. Here we go. Go tell it on the mountain Well, good morning and welcome here. If you are guests with us this morning, a special welcome to you. Some of you are maybe traveling here just for the weekend. Welcome here uh, in the, the Sunday between Christmas and New Year. So some of us, this is an early morning maybe for the first time we got out of bed and got out of the house. Welcome to Out of the House. Uh, we're happy to see you here this morning. Uh, just a few announcements as we get started this morning. Um, as we are wrapping up Christmas in Lethbridge, wrapping up our Christmas season, uh, we have, behind Christmas in Lethbridge, our hope was that we were inviting people from our community, from our workplace, our neighbors, that they would be able to hear the gospel maybe for the first time and to engage in conversations that maybe uh, you don't know how to have yourself. And so as we continue on those conversations, and I hope that you are continuing those conversations, um, as a church, we're offering Alpha starting on January 15th, and it will take place here at the church. And Alpha is an opportunity for you to um, bring, bring people or even come as yourself where you can answer some of the, the, the why and the how questions of, 
of Christian faith and, and get to know Jesus and, and what he means for our life. And so I encourage you, if you haven't taken the program where you're looking for a way to build on the conversations that have been started this Christmas, look into Alpha. And maybe you are just looking for an opportunity to serve in our church. Um, Alpha is a great opportunity starting off this new year. We are looking for people to be on our prayer team, people to be on our kitchen prep team. Part of it is we, we serve a meal as these com- to have during these conversations. And we're also looking for people to be on our setup and teardown team. And so if that's you that you're maybe interested, there is a kiosk in the lobby and you can sign up or ask more questions about that there. Um, another um, opportunity to, to have conversation. Uh, we, we're a big church and, and sometimes it's, it's hard to get to know one another. And so we are doing Let's Have Lunch. And so this will be next Sunday after our services happening in the gym. And it's a way that we can sit down have a meal together and, and just have conversation and, and make our big community a little bit smaller. And a way that we practice this every Sunday is we have greeting time. And so I'm going to invite you guys to stand up, shake some hands, say hello, Happy New Year to the people around you. Hey, thanks.
for the one who has come to set us free. No height, no depth can separate Your steadfast love who can escape Your faithfulness an endless sea So full of grace and mercy We sing God is so good God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. when I'm talking to my pastor and theology friends, the question comes up, how do you help people read the Bible? Because the Bible is both very easy to read and very difficult to read at the same time. The question I've heard posed many times is, you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, boy, God sounds like he gets mad at times. Sounds like he wipes out nations. How do you handle that? How do you understand that? What's the context but the context is Jesus. Colossians says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You want to get to know God? Get to know Jesus. That'll help you understand everything that's in the Bible. If you understand Jesus, 
if you catch a glimpse of him, you'll understand who God is and God's incredible heart for us and his love for all of mankind and his desire for nothing but the best for every single one of us. So this Christmas, we see the beginning of that glimpse. Every time we remember Christmas, we remember the birth of Jesus. God come to earth, Emmanuel, helping us understand the heart of the Father. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Oh, God is so I'm going to end our 2019, this is our last Sunday of the year, with a, with a prayer. I'm going to pray for us today, a prayer of thanksgiving. And I know as I look around, 2019 hasn't always been a year of thanksgiving. For some of you struggling with illness or death has happened or broken relationships or the things that have gone on in your year that you look back over 2019 and you can't always see God's goodness. That's not always right there front of mind but I but I know that when we dig through and, and we look through our lives and look through the things that have happened this last year uh, God has shown up good God has shown himself in new ways to many of us we've heard his voice we've uh, deepened our relationships maybe even we've seen him show up in healing things or good things in our lives and so this morning we're just gonna I'm gonna take a little bit of time and lead us in prayer uh, I'll pray for all sorts of things and and if in that time you have other things to pray for, please uh, thank God for those great things this 2019 has, has given, the things that he has done, and how he's supplied for us. Will you just bow and pray with me this morning? God, we, we know when we look back over 2019, there's been hard things. Uh, 2019 has brought difficult situations and has brought illness maybe and has brought broken and has brought things that are difficult to understand and, and not always uh, your goodness isn't always front of mind, isn't always our first thought. But God, we know as we look back, you've also showed up. You've also revealed yourself and comforted us and, and been in our, in our places and, and drawn us into your presence, God, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we could have started 2019 with a new pastor and you've, you've brought Jeff to us and, and you've led us this year and, and, and you've served him and you've, and you've filled him so that he could lead us. Thank you, God, for leading us through him. Thank you for bringing him here. God, we pray that you continue to show yourself uh, in the direction that our church is going. Thank you for the opportunities we've had this year to serve our community. Already at Easter, when we got to be in the exhibition and have a huge Easter service to celebrate you. God, for the community to be a part of and for us to be a part of the community. God, throughout all of the different ministry areas and the things that have gone on in this church and the way that people have gathered here and been served here, whether it be through funerals or weddings or events that we put on, God, but that you are, you are magnified and you are glorified through the things that happen here. And you've showed up and you've comforted people and you've shown yourself and you've spoken to people and people have heard your voice. Thank you, God, too, that we can be a part of community things when we have identity here, or when we uh, engage in Advent conspiracy and are generous. Because you're generous to us with your love and your care for us and your, your peace and presence in our lives, God, we can be generous to others. Through the use of our building and inviting all the identity kids, the 500 students into our place to, to um, speak life to them to speak your love to them, but also the opportunity to just collect money and, and serve our community that way and give it away and, and bless others with that Advent, Advent conspiracy, God. Bless our community and the children and the families that that allows, that, that money allows that to happen. God, we just thank you. We thank you for being a good God and for showing yourself in new ways to us this year, for comforting for peace, for love, 
for new life. God, I, I, I'm overwhelmed when I think of people's faces and what you've done in our lives this year. Thank you, God, for this church, that we can be together to serve you, that we can be together to be a light for our community and the different places that we are, that we get to go. God, I pray that you continue to go with us, that 2020 be a year that is even, uh, we can stand at the end of 2020 and be even more thankful for what you've done, for how you've guided us, for how you've shown up again. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen. Uh, just before the ushers come up and collect the offering, this is the last uh, Sunday. The last time a plate will be passed around in 2019. So if you want to be a part of Advent Conspiracy, this is still a chance for you to, to give to that. This is still a chance for you to give to our general budget. There's still opportunity to give to that till the end of the year. But this is a chance for us to continue our discipleship and give to the things that happen. We just prayed a bunch, all, a bunch about a bunch of things that happened in our church community this year that happened because of generous donors and so if this is a part of your discipleship and and you want to be a part of the ministry that happens here in a financial way this is also one of those times so ken if you lead us again in a song and ushers if you'd come down and collect the offering let's stand to sing my hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Sing that again My hope is built on nothing less Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on
Rest in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the Lord. Christ Ended with the core, with a verse, when he shall come with trumpet sound, O may I then be in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. So many of our old hymns look forward to the, those last days, the days in Revelation, when God makes all things right and the sad things are undone. And that's what our sermon series is about in Advent this year. We've started in Genesis, worked our way through catching glimpses of God's promises and God's grace. And today, we're looking at those end chapters in Revelation, uh, the final hope that we have. Mark, if you could read scripture for us, thanks. All right, I'm going to be reading scripture from Revelation 21, the first seven verses. So if you'd like to open your Bibles or your apps or wherever you're going to follow along, maybe on the screen. We're going to be re reading from Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite Joel Gross up here. Many of you know him. You've seen him up here. He's one of our interns, and he's going to be sharing scripture the message for us this morning so i'm going to pray for you joel before we start mm -hmm. god we love you we thank you for joel we thank you for his heart and his love for you his desire to know more about you and experience you in a real way thank you for his love for you and his love for other people how that uh, his love for you bleeds through him for others God, thank you, too, for the words that you've given him already laid on his heart and, and to paper. And, God, the thought that he's put into this and the desire that he has to share uh, what you have for us. God, uh, soften our hearts. Speak to us. Change us. God, let yourself be known to us this morning. Amen. Amen. Hello? Oh, okay. There we go. I muted it. All right. Uh, well, good morning, church. In this time in between Christmas and New Year's where you don't really know what day it is, but you made it to church, so glad you're here. Uh, I had a friend who actually went to Mexico 
over the holidays, and they, they came back, and they were showing me these pictures, and they were showing me uh, like these videos, and they were laughing and telling stories, and just all about uh, how the sand was between their toes, and how they could just hear the waves crashing, and they just described the sun beating down on their skin. And I'm just listening, and I'm looking at pictures of them snorkeling, and pictures of them snorkeling next to sea turtles. And then the next picture was a, a picture of them pulling sea urchins out of their feet because they were swimming next to sea turtles. Uh, and, then, and then after all this, I was just like happy and was just like, wow, do you know what would be better than hearing about a vacation? Going on a vacation. <laughs> right? Like hearing about something is, only gets you so far, but experiencing it, going, actually feeling the sun, actually feeling the water, the, the sand, actually being in the presence, experiencing the laughter, the stories that just can't be portrayed as well through story, through hearing something. So sure, you can talk about it, but actually being there, feeling it is something completely different. So when we read a passage of scripture like Revelation 21, when this happens, when the return of Christ is here, when every tear will be wiped, when death will be defeated, when there will be no more mourning, that experience is going to be so much greater than reading about it. If that gets you excited, imagine the reality of it. The the physical presence of God. Death being defeated once and for all. Throughout this series, we've had the, the benefit of standing in 2019, looking back and reading historically what's happened through Scripture We've navigated from Genesis, we've seen David, we've, we've been working our way through to the, the story and the fulfillment of all those things in the person of Jesus Christ. We've been reading historically what has happened, but now we're going to read uh, of something promised, what's going to happen. Jeff started off our series in Genesis 3, what he called the worst chapter in the entire Bible. The fall, the sin of man, darkness entering our world. And now we're landing the plane here, ending our promises series in Revelation 21, the most hopeful chapter in the entire Bible. Verses 1, Revelation 21, 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. What we're reading here is the new creation that God's going to institute at his second coming. And I love that word new, a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. It's not restored. He didn't say we're going, to, we're going to restore the heavens and restore the earths. God's not going, well, I put a whole lot of work into the first heaven and a whole lot of work into the first earth. He's not just going to band-aid it up and throw an aspirin and, and fix up the little nooks and crannies. No, he's going to restore everything. And he's starting at the drawing board, the foundations. New heaven and a new earth. The world that we're living in has this ticking timer where all things will pass away and what is new right and perfect will be built into something we can't fathom and I saw a holy city new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God as a bride adorned for her groom isn't this just beautiful imagery so God created this new heaven and he's creating this new earth And out of its heavenly glories, he just sees this bride-like holy city descending as a bride longing for her husband. This bridegroom imagery that we see here is quite common between Christ and his church. The church being us, us who believe in this long expectant hope. Like a bride waiting for her groom, this holy city will descend on its anxiously waiting and ready church. And he continues in verse 3. And heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, with him as their God. God is redeeming his people back to him. What he has purposed since the beginning, unfettered adoration of God with his people, dwelling with his creation. What we were designed for in the creation, God in his fullness with us. Unhindered. This is going to be completely realized at the second coming of Christ. And it's in this place that God will rid the cosmos of any sin that's tainting this world. 
anything dark, any little deviance that's following you around or that you are experiencing in life will be completely abolished at the return of Christ. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Like, aren't we longing for this? Like, don't you read that and just have this angst for this? At the depths of every person's soul, I think we all want to get back to this wholeness that's life with Christ. Like, even if you don't know Jesus, you have this longing to get back to this place of perfection where every tear will be wiped, where there will be no more death, pain, mourning, embarrassment, those weights that are hanging over you that you can't seem to shake, and they're all just going to be gone at this moment. And it doesn't take being a Christian to feel this. It doesn't take feeling a Christian to feel the weight of imperfection. I think it does, although, take a Christian to understand why you feel this way. And I, I don't think there's anyone in this room who's going, no, Joel, like, the, you got that wrong. The world's pretty perfect right now. Right? Like, I don't think there's anyone in here that's, that's trying to argue with me that this world is, is perfect the way that it is. Uh, we all know at our depths that there's something wrong. And we're trying to get back to that place where perfection is the standard. And right here, God is saying, no, I know that it's broken. He's saying, it was never supposed to be this way. I was supposed to be your God. You were supposed to be my people. We were supposed to be dwelling in the garden forever as it was meant to be. He's saying, I know it hurts living in that broken world where death is just looming around. But he's saying, there's going to be this day. There's going to be this day coming where that weight's going to be lifted. It's going to be gone, where I'm going to wipe every tear from your eyes. There will be a time that you won't even remember that crummy little brown ball down there because my presence and my omnipotence just simply won't allow it. The reality of the fractured world we live in will no longer be a reality. Behold, I am making all things new. When Adam and Eve brought darkness into this world and they gave themselves over to the serpent's deception... They hid themselves from the presence of God. And at that first glimpse of shame, at that first glimpse of a fractured universe, God has been pursuing his people and setting into motion a plan to restore back to himself a people of his own possession, calling us to dwell with him in completely realized glory. This has been the call and the pursuit of Christ. This is the hope that we're waiting for in these verses here. What we saw last week was the promises fulfilled, right standing before God when Jesus Christ came. The bridge had been built. The the gap had been mended. Death had been defeated. Atonement for our sins completely realized in God himself showing up as the sacrificial lamb that was slain. But what we're reading this week is the the fulfillment of all scripture, the completion of the entire Bible and what God is going to do at his second coming. Not only is God going to do this, but verses 5 and 6. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. The voice from the throne is declaring to John in this vision, it's happened. What I'm telling you is completed. I'm the beginning, I'm the the end, and because I am the essence of time, this is already finished. But look at what he says right before this. Write this down, for my words are trustworthy and true. See, John's getting this amazing vision from the Lord. He's in this trance God of, of, of the Lord just being restored back to God, back to perfect unity with the King of glory. And in the middle of this, God just pulls him back and he says, write this down because it's true. I mean, John's probably trusting him at this point, you would think. I mean, he's 21 chapters into this vision. You'd think at this point he's past that original 
shock of God showing himself to him. Surely he's trusting God already. He's, he's devoted himself to being a disciple. He's followed him his life. And John, but if you're John here, you're starting to build some doubts that this thing's real. Right? Like if you're John, you have been wrung out by the strongholds of life in a post-Genesis 3 world. John's hearing God say a new heaven, a new earth, every tear will be wiped from your eyes. And then you're going to tell me that this is all finished in the end? Because if you're John here, you've got some questions. Every single one of the disciples, the frontline soldiers for the gospel, were martyred for their faith. John is the last one alive. Simon and, and Andrew, they were crucified on a cross. Peter didn't think himself worthy to be crucified, so they crucified him upside down. Philip was hung by his ankles and bled out. James was beheaded. All these and more on account of the word. John, who's having this vision right now, was boiled alive in oil. And God didn't allow him to taste death in that moment. So they couldn't kill him. So they just banished him to Patmos where he's getting this vision and he's going to work manual labor for the rest of his life. And God is giving him this vision of hope in a time like this. This is the setting that he's in. So it, it begs the question, what do we do when this reality seems so far from reality? What happens when we open up scripture and we read that death has been defeated on the cross once and for all in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't feel like it? Is anyone else confused by this? John 10.10, 10, Christ came and died so that we could have life to the full. Revelation 21 is declaring it is done and if all this is true, why are there seasons where this just seems so absent from our reality? No wonder God has to reassure John to trust him. I mean, Scripture is quite clear. Death is over. It is available to those who put their trust in the Lord. And this sounds nice. And for, for everyone, in, everyone who's a Christian, it's what drew us in the first place. The kingdom of God is here. The renewal, the, the peace you're looking for, the joy and fulfillment, that longing, that satisfying of the longing of the angst has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ on the cross on Calvary Hill. It drew every one of us into saving faith. But what do we do when that spiritually seems far from reality? What do we do when we're told death is defeated, but you still feel death? Or the grave has been broken, but you still feel the grave? If you, uh, I feel this all the time in my own life. It's like we're in this space of, I found it, but I'm still looking for it. Where, where, where I need it, but I've, but I've got it. Where I'm, I'm right standing before God, I'm blameless in his sight, but I'm still a sinner. Even this passage in Revelation 21 is struggling with this. I don't know if you caught it. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. He will be their God. <clears throat> and after all of these he wills, he carries on to say, it is finished. Well, which is it? Will he do this or is it finished? Theologians struggle with this concept and, and they've come up with this definition and this description called the already and not yet where it's this middle tension between the death on the cross and this passage in Revelation 21, the return of Christ, where we've been given this eternity as our hope, but our bodies are futile. And that, that just brings me to, to Romans 8.10, where it says, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So our our spirit is alive, but our bodies are decrepit, right? Like we live in this space where kingdom breakthrough moments can happen at, at any time. You hear stories of this all the time. People just being healed immediately. You know, people, you, we, we make movies about people just coming to Christ and becoming pastors. Like someone was just eating their breakfast and they saw the outline of Jesus in the oatmeal and then, and then, 20 minutes later in the movie, they're a pastor in Africa. Like, we see these, and these things happen. These incredible breakthrough, Shekinah glory moments that have no rational explanation. But we know that they don't always happen. We pray for healing and salvation for our friends, and sometimes they repent and just fall at the foot of the cross. 
and we celebrate, but sometimes they don't. This is the already, but not yet. Uh, at, at young adults, we had this girl who's been suffering with post-concussion syndrome. She had headaches and she was vomiting and she couldn't drive. They took her license from her. Uh, and it was quite a while. And then we just like laid hands on her and we brought out the oil and we just prayed and we expected that God was going to show up and he was going to heal her. And three days later, she got her license back. Her, her, her symptoms were gone and it was incredible. And we celebrate those moments. But I also have this other really dear friend who for over a year and a half has been suffering with the same stuff. And it seems like the prayers just won't come through and that it just won't happen. God is active in our universe and he intercedes in unexplainable ways. In April, I was rock climbing and I was up this mountain and I fell 60 feet. And I, I woke up in the hospital. I didn't know who my niece was. I didn't know how old I was. I didn't know what year it was. Didn't know all this stuff. And then when I woke, when they sent me to Calgary and I got to Calgary, it was just everything was back. I had headaches for a while, and, but not a scratch, not a bruise, nothing. These are just kingdom breakthrough moments. And we know that these happen, and we do. And we could go around and we could tell story after story of things like this. But yet we still feel this downward pressure of the reality that not everyone walks away from accidents. And when we think about this theologically, people tend to land in two very different camps. The first, with good intentions, um, is with this over-realized lens, this over-realized sense of the already but not yet, where God will heal every time. It is God's will that every single person be healed from everything. And if you have enough faith and you pray enough, then it'll happen. And it's fueled by this really dangerous word of faith movement that's growing rapidly in the States. And it is very, very dangerous. It leads to a whole lot of doubt in the goodness of God. It puts a faith crisis pressure on you that only if you had enough faith, then God would have healed. It's dangerous. Don't put that pressure on people. I think the worst of all is sometimes we can catch ourselves preaching the gospel this way. That if you put your faith in Jesus and you believe in him, you will no longer feel any sort of burden ever. That if that brokenness you're carrying around is going to be shattered by the cross of Christ, we get caught up preaching this false idea that somehow believing in Jesus will get rid of every single earthly trouble. And it's just not true. All of the apostles were murdered. Paul straight up was told by God, I will not heal you. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm not taken away from God here. He can restore. He does heal the brokenhearted. He does bring sight to the blind. He does heal people and bring salvation and bring joy and fulfillment. He does do this. And I'm on my knees praying almost daily that this will happen. But it doesn't always happen. And when we share the gospel as if it happens every single time, it's like the parable of the sower that Luke was preaching about a few weeks ago in Mark 4 where they, the seed fell on rocky soil and they received the word and they were, they were joyful and they were celebrating and they, they got this good news and then as soon as trial and as soon as tribulation came, they fell away immediately. Their faith was exposed as fake. Overrealized sense of the already but not yet. And then there's this whole pendulum swing to the opposite side and it's this under-realized lens where God cannot heal and he, he does not heal and, and all those promises that we're reading about in scripture, those, those were all fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and they're not available for us today. The spirit does not move. This is not a reality that we live in. And what you get here is a whole lot of cynical Christians who retreat back to, well, if it's the will of God, well, if it's the will of God, you'll get healed. No, just pray. Just get on your knees and plead with God. Yes, the will of God will happen. I promise that. But your call is to pray, get on your knees before an almighty God and plead and expect that he's going to show up. This is how we live as Christians in the space of the already and not yet. We're going through Daniel as young adults this semester. And I came across this passage in chapter 3 where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're, 
there before King Nebuchadnezzar, this powerful ruler who at the snap of his finger could have them executed. And they're refusing to bow down to the golden image that he set up. So he's holding them in front of a furnace and he's going to say, I'm going to throw you in here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say to King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 3, 17 to 18, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from it. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. So God can heal. He can break through the shadows that are looming in this broken world. He will do it. We lean into the expectation that he will show up. But even if he doesn't, we stand strong in our faith. He will and he can, but even if he doesn't. And we can proclaim this and we can live this because our faith is not swinging in the wind by what God does for us, but it's anchored in the person and, and character of Jesus Christ. We need to understand these realities or we'll fall or we'll either A, be crushed by an unrealistic expectation of our reality or we'll either B, have no faith and no hope that God is active and moves in incredible kingdom ways presently. We'd go around the room if we had time and tell story after story about how we have witnessed the kingdom of God echoing in our lives. Kingdom breakthrough moments, story and story after, story after story of the already. But we could also go around and tell story after story of deep pain and hurt that we felt and we're probably still feeling. That's the not yet. So the question is, how do we live in the reality of the already but not yet with the hope of Revelation 21 kingdom things to come? How do we live in this space of tension waiting for Christ to return? Well, let's see what Jesus told us to do. Matthew 25, he, he, he explains this parable of the ten virgins. He says, it goes like this. There's, there's ten brides waiting for their bridegroom. And, and five of them, they brought oil for their lamps because they said, maybe, maybe he's going to come back at night. Maybe he'll come back at night. We'll just be ready. And the other five said, no, we're probably not going to. I doubt that he would. So when the, when the groom came, he came at midnight, and the five were scrambling. They, they were like, give us some of your oil. They said, well, no, we're not going to have enough for ourselves. So the five ran back to get more oil. And when he came, the five who were prepared went with him to the wedding. And the five who were ill-prepared got left behind. Christ says, how to wait in this long expectant hope is be ready. As a bride prepared for the bridegroom, just waiting in anticipations for the holy matrimony to come. Be ready. Because this is not just merely a, well, I hope that this happens. Every single thing that this book has declared has come true. It's all happened. It's not a matter of if, it's when. As Christ's bride, we've been given the duty to prepare for the wedding. Our call is to be ready. Because what if he came back tomorrow? And further than that, do you want him to come back tomorrow? It might not be as easy to answer as you think. There's this young adult who I was talking to someone and, and they said, well, I'm just not ready for Christ to come back yet. Like, it sounds good, but I'm not done. Like, I don't have my degree. I haven't got married. I don't have my kids. I haven't traveled to this area of the world yet. I haven't lived my life yet. But if you understand the realities that are being unfolded in Scripture here, you don't care about those things anymore. You have no ties to the world. A bride who's ready will forsake everything and count all as transient preparing for the wedding. Experiencing this reality would be so much better than reading about it or hearing about it or thinking about it. Are you ready? It will happen soon. If Paul and Jesus both say it's happening soon, we can expect that it's happening soon. And you're probably thinking, well, every generation since Christ has thought that it's going to be in their lifetime. And I think that that's right. We should. Every generation should be posturing their lives in the already but not yet, waiting in anticipation for this to happen. They should be ready. 
cultivating lives that are just submitted to the Lord. This is a reality. It's declared. It is done. So stay awake, stay expectant, and use this as a motivation to fuel you into ministry. Nobody will want to miss out on this future glory. And for some, when the time comes, the reality is it will be too late. If we believe that this is true, then this should be our passion that drives us. If we believe that this is true at our core, every single person we meet, we should desire that they experience this too. If you're thinking, I want to be ready, but, I, but how? Like, I want to be ready for this, but how do you, how do, you do that? Well, scripture tells us, put your hope in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That baby that was born 2,000 years ago, that child that entered our world, he bore your sin for you. He was crucified, died, and rose again so that we might be ready. If you repent and put your hope in Jesus Christ, there is life to be had. There is fulfillment to be had. There are answers to those questions that you have. Wait and rest in these promises. Be excited and posture your lives around this joy and anticipation. Uh, a pastor once wrote that at the, at the coming of Christ, the glory of the Lord will be seen as the pinnacle of all stories. In this reality of Christ's return, all other ideologies, hopes, trusts, all other gods will be exposed as false and Christ will establish his kingdom forever. Upon the return of Christ, it will be exposed that all of our folly, all of our misguided, misplaced trust will never be enough to satisfy the angst in our souls. He will reveal in this moment that relationships, the accumulation of more stuff, this hyper-competitive comparison nature, the glory and praise of mankind will always fall short of his omnipotent might. There's going to be, this will be the apex of God's story. Jesus is coming back clothed in majesty. He's going to do something huge, something that will reestablish and redefine the elevation of his glory. It will reorientate the world's perception on what is most beautiful, most bountiful, and most true. In a few short days, the chapter on 2019 will close. I'm going to be at a ski hill celebrating looking back, telling stories, laughing. But as the calendar churns, this whole year will be a distant memory. Everything that 2019 brought will be completed, and we're going to be one year closer to the cloud of glory descending on this broken, fractured world. Jesus Christ will establish his reign, rule, and authority forever and ever. So be excited. Channel that excitement and move and allow it to move you into a ministry and a life that satisfies him and is submitted to him. God is coming back. He will return. He's going to complete what he has already set in motion. Let's pray, church. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for this place. Thank you for hearts who desire you and wait in anticipation for you, Lord. God, we want to be a church who's ready for you, who is prepared. So Lord, would you stir in our hearts how to do that? Would we just be so kingdom-minded and kingdom-focused? Lord, would we love you? Would you just draw us in more and more and just use that to propel us into ministry, Lord? Because when this comes, people will not want to miss. Lord, may you bless 2020 and may it just be bountiful for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for pointing us towards Christ. The all already that's accomplished and the not yet that we have to look forward to. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a couple of songs in response. This first one, I'm guessing many of us won't know. At least I didn't know it last week until we started talking about the sermon and what could be a good song to follow it. So please join in as soon as you can.
It goes like this. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. beginning and all of creation.
even so come, Lord Jesus, Amen. May that song be true as we leave this place. 
Um, my prayer for us as we, as we go, we have, we've worked through this series, Promises. We started at Genesis. We walked through the story of Adam and Eve and the fall, and God made a promise to them. And then we worked through the story of Abraham and the story of Moses, all the way through to the birth of Christ, which we've just celebrated this Christmas season. And through the birth of Christ, we have the promise of his return. And so as we go from this place, may we remember that God keeps his promises, that he has a plan and a purpose for us as we go from here, that we can trust in his goodness and in his faithfulness. Have a great week, church.